Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome back to Naturalist Training. Hope you're all doing well tonight. Just a quick reminder, as usual, we will be keeping you muted um, tonight for the presentation, but there will be time at the end for questions. So hold on to those questions and um, we will allow you to unmute yourselves at the end. Tonight, we have Shahir Masri. Shahir has a Bachelor of Science degree from the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA, as well as both a Master's and Doctor of Science degrees from the Department of Environmental Health at Harvard School of Public Health. He currently works on air pollution exposure modeling and climate change communication research at UC Irvine. And prior to this pandemic, he was, uh, he traveled the country for, I think a couple of years, uh, kind of on and off uh, with a project that he founded called On the Road for Climate Action, uh, where he talked to people in different communities around the nation about our changing climate and really worked to raise awareness about the issue. Um, so welcome Shahir, I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, thanks so much. Um... Nice to see all of your uh, faces and names, uh, despite the uh, challenging times. I know that uh, we would love to all be at the Newport uh, Bay Conservancy. It's such a beautiful location. But um, thanks for tuning in nonetheless. I'm always happy to give these talks and uh, you know try to raise awareness about this important issue and always partner with uh, national, uh, the, the um, Newport Bay Conservancy. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, so. Let's see. The first, um, I guess the way that I've kind of designed uh, the structure of my talk is to dive into the climate science uh, first. I think that's the logical place to start. And then we'll talk about climate impacts and some of that um, tour that Hillary just mentioned, uh, my travels across the country and talk a bit about what I observed on the road and also what um, you know, this sort of state of climate impacts is in the country and the world. And then uh, with some added time, I think, uh, or with some time at the end, we'll dive into some climate solutions, which people tend to want to hear about after hearing all about the uh, uh, stressful issue that climate change really has become. So uh, with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and dive in. So climate science, uh, why do we care? I think that's the first question to pose. And we care for a variety of reasons. Um, one important reason is that temperatures have been going up and up and up in recent years. We've been seeing uh, decade after decade increases in temperature. Now there's a variety of, um, well, let me step back and say, when I do talk about climate, I'm specifically referring to climate as it's defined uh, as opposed to weather. So weather is that temperature that you feel uh, in the morning or at night. It's that cold winter uh, day or that hot summer afternoon. Climate on the other hand, uh, that's weather. Climate on the other hand is the long-term average of basically those um, up and downs, those temperature up and downs of precipitation um, changes and so on and so forth. So we are really seeing changes in the long-term average of weather uh, over time. And that is what climate is. And that's what we are referring to when you talk about climate change. Now, climate change has been one of those uh, topics, as you're probably all aware, that has been kind of um, politicized. There's a lot of people who have uh, things to say about climate change. Um, I think one of the interesting things to note is, you know, whether, you know, there's people who are skeptical about climate change, which is a grow, uh, shrinking minority uh, or not, even those sort of skeptical arguments as to why the climate's changing, um, whether it's solar cycles, uh, sunspots, uh, they all, or greenhouse gas emissions, they all share one thing in common. They all um, share basically the fact that the sun influences Earth's temperatures. Uh, that's sort of the commonality behind all the different you know, things that you've probably heard that might in, uh, influence the climate. Now we're gonna talk about the things that do influence the climate, uh, both historically, due, uh, the paleo climate, and also in the present day. But again, whether it's uh, solar cycles, greenhouse gases, uh, what we're gonna talk about, the Milankovitch cycles, 
climate in general and its ups and downs all depend on this bright yellow object in the sky known as the sun. Now, the Milankovitch cycles, what am I talking about here? So uh, we all know that the Earth orbits the sun, but it's less known that the shape of that orbit actually changes over time. It changes from more circular to more elliptical and back again. Uh, that cycle takes about 100,000 years to complete. There's other planetary cycles, such as obliquity, which is essentially the tilt of the Earth. Right now, we're at about 23 and a half degrees off the axis, um, but we're not always at 23 and a half degrees. That shifts back and forth over time. It takes about 46,000 years to complete one of those cycles. And then we have something known as precession. If you ever spun a top on your desk, uh, maybe when you're a kid, you notice that as the top slows down, it starts to wobble. And that wobble, uh, the physics that that uh, dictates the wobble of that top is the same physics that dictates the wobble of a rotating object the size of the Earth. Uh, so Earth actually spins and wobbles. And that wobble is known as precession, and it takes around 22,000 years to go uh, to complete one cycle of precession. So my point in explaining all this is to, like, to tell you that these things all do influence the climate. They play a role in temperatures on Earth. But these are very gradual processes on the order of tens of thousands of years. Um, so while they do play an important role in, in governing Earth's temperatures, they're uh, not explaining the sharp decade after decade increases in temperature that we've been seeing, seeing in recent decades and recent years. Um, there's something also known as the solar cycles, which uh, you might have heard when talking about climate change. Solar cycles are also fluctuating, but they fluctuate. And when I say solar cycles, I'm actually referring to the fluctuation in the emissivity or the emissions of energy, the emissions of sunlight coming from the sun. The sun is not emitting energy at a constant uh, rate. It's actually fluctuating and those fluctuations known as solar cycles oscillate on about 11 year cycles. So uh, they play a very small uh, role in, in Earth's temperatures, but they're there. And uh, in this case, we're talking about cycles about every decade. So something that's going up and down every decade surely is not explaining um, temperatures that are going up and up and up decade after decade after decade. So in one case, we've got um, mismatched cycles because these are far too long and then mismatched cycles because these are far too short. So let's talk about another uh, influence of temperatures on Earth known as the greenhouse effect. Um, these are all natural drivers of climate. In the case of the greenhouse effect, uh, you're all familiar with the greenhouse effect, whether you know it or not. Uh, if you've ever gotten in your car on a, on a cold day, as long as the sun's shining, temperatures in your car are going to be warmer than outside. And the reason is the same reason that keeps a botanical greenhouse warm. Uh, basically, the short wave solar radiation is coming through, penetrating the glass of your car or the glass of the greenhouse. And when it heats up the interior of your car, or in this case, the interior of this, the plants, the soil in this greenhouse, um, it re-radiates energy. And those objects re-radiate energy at a different wavelength. It's a longer wavelength. It cannot escape the glass. So we've got a net influx of energy. Energy coming into glass, uh, it's not all able to escape. And consequently, we get an increase in temperatures within the greenhouse. That's what allows these greenhouses to be warm and grow tropical plants, even in areas that aren't humid and tropical. And it's also why your car is warm in uh, the winter on a sunny day. Now, in the context of the Earth, we also have a greenhouse, a natural greenhouse. But instead of the glass surrounding the greenhouse, we have something known as an atmosphere. And more specifically, we have a series, a variety of gases known as greenhouse gases, which are really effective at trapping that outgoing radiation that is coming off of Earth's surface after it's been warmed by the sun. So uh, you can think of Earth's atmosphere as the sort of glass around the greenhouse, the glass around Earth, or you can think of it as the blanket because essentially uh, when you put a blanket on at night, uh, there's a similar, um, a, a similar physics in, in, in play there. But the, uh, the blanket in that case is what's absorbing your outgoing body's radiation. Well, here we've got the atmosphere. Now, the greenhouse effect has gotten a sort of bad name in recent history, but it's uh, because of climate change. But it's really important, I think, to mention from the outset that uh, the greenhouse effect is inherently a good thing for us. If we didn't have the greenhouse effect, uh, we'd be sitting on an Earth 
the temperature of which would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit on average. Uh, right now we're close to 60 degrees Fahrenheit on average. So it would be a frigid, inhospitable, very cold, cold planet. So we're grateful for this greenhouse effect for allowing uh, Earth's surface essentially to retain heat from the sun. Um, climate change today is really a story of too much of a bad, of a good thing being a bad thing. Um, that's basically what's been happening as we've been injecting more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We've uh, contributed to warming of the earth. We were effectively closing the window of the greenhouse, if you will. And consequently, temperatures are going up, as I just showed you. And, uh, and it's for that reason that people are concerned about climate change and why the greenhouse effect has gotten a bad name. But in and of itself, not a bad thing. Um, here's what greenhouse gases, specifically carbon dioxide, have been doing over time. Uh, they've been going, greenhouse gases, sorry, carbon dioxide has been going up and up and up. This is a graph that shows you in this, um, this, this line that's closer to the current date. This is measurements that were directly taken by a scientist by the name of Charles David Keeling, who basically was me measuring carbon dioxide as part of his um, postdoctoral fellowship for a very long time. And this measurement of carbon dioxide, this global measurement that was taken at the top of, of Hawaii, uh, essentially became his life's work and ultimately earned him a Nobel Prize as he was essentially um, sounding the alarm that we had an impending climate crisis because he was measuring this very potent greenhouse gas, this greenhouse gas that we all knew could trap heat and does trap heat on Earth. He was measuring it going up and up and up decade after decade after decade. Now, using ice core data, we can actually drill into ancient ice sheets and measure the trap bubbles of gas that are stored underneath to get an idea of what greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide were like before we actually were directly measuring them in the air. And from that ice core data, we see that carbon dioxide was going up in the atmosphere much earlier than when Dr. Keeling started measuring it, but actually around the mid 1800s. Now, the reasons for this are no mystery to science, uh, namely the combustion of fossil fuels, gas, uh, coal and oil, for the production of electricity and to power our cars and other automobiles. This has been the um, predominant driver of this influx of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere on Earth. So if we put CO2 and temperature, to, uh, temperature together over recent history dating back to the mid 1800s, uh, you get a graph that looks like this. As one has been trickling up, the other has been falling. Now this slide, um, this is a little bit more of a technical slide. I'm just going to kind of highlight the gist of the matter here. Um, this is just pointing out if, if you look at the x axis on the bottom and the y axis on the, on the, uh, the vertical axis. Essentially what this is showing is that both Earth and the Sun emit radiation. Um, if you look at the bottom, which is the wavelength of light, the Sun emits radiation in a much uh, shorter wavelength. So in the nanometers to micrometers range, and there's a lot more of that energy. On the sun, uh, sorry, in the case of the earth, which is in red, you're also seeing radiation emitted by the earth. Um, so even though it's not a bright object like the sun, it still does emit radiation, largely emitting the radiation that it's absorbing from the sun. So this is really the basis um, that you need to know to understand why the greenhouse effect is the greenhouse effect. And when I mentioned that the energy is entering the greenhouse and changing wavelength and being re-radiated, that's what you're just seeing here in the graph. Both of these planets, uh, sun's not a planet, but both of, both of these um, bodies are emitting radiation. And because of that, we have this um, greenhouse effect. So this is just uh, another schematic showing you this process of uh, the greenhouse effect. Incoming radiation being trapped uh, uh, being hitting the earth and being trapped as it tries to escape. And then um, if you wanted to look at this kind of broken up into percentages, let's look at the sunlight entering earth. If we have 100% of the light to start with, you can see with these arrows what's happening to that sunlight as it hits the earth. 6% is getting reflected right away from the atmosphere. Um, another 20% being reflected by the clouds. By the time we get to the surface of the earth, about 50% of the sun's radiation is hitting the surface. Now that radiation is in red as it goes out because we're trying to highlight the fact that it's a different type of radiation. 
And as that 50% makes its way back upward, uh, you can see where it goes. 64% uh, approximately getting radiated back out to space from clouds. Um, now note this line here in the middle. Can you all see my cursor as I move it? Or, okay. So this line here in the middle is the line that we should pay attention to when we're considering greenhouse, the greenhouse effect. This is what's absorbed by the atmosphere. And it's the change of that 16% that is driving climate change. As we add more carbon dioxide, more methane, nitrous oxide, and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we're essentially increasing this fraction um, by you know, a few percentage points. And that's important when we're thinking about this whole um, process of where energy goes on Earth from the sun. So we are essentially trapping more heat on the planet, and that's why temperatures are going up. Now, this is, I'm not going to show too many more graphs, uh, don't worry, uh, but this is an important graph, probably the most important graph you'll see as it relates to climate change. This is a graph going back 400,000 years showing carbon dioxide and temperature. Um, now, the immediate takeaway, I think, is that, well, for one thing, temperatures have been going up and down, carbon dioxide has been going up and down for quite a long time, long before we ever were driving our cars. Uh, we we're around to drive cars and to, um, you know, burn coal and oil and all of that. So in this sort of second part of this talk, we'll get more into some climate misconceptions. But one thing that you sometimes hear if you're talking about climate change to people is that uh, climate change is natural. And, um, you know, therefore, there's nothing, nothing to worry about. Now, this graph actually shows that that's actually true. It, the first part of that statement, that is that climate change is natural. So again, temperatures have been changing for a long time, long before we were influencing them, uh, them. The important point of climate change is that there's an acceleration at play. So really what we should be talking about is not climate change because climate change, as you can see in this graph, is natural, but climate change acceleration. It's the acceleration of that background rate of change that is really what we're talking about. Um, again, I'll dive a little bit more into that move uh, in, a, in about 30 minutes or so. But looking at this graph, we see that indeed climate change has a natural uh, cyclical component. You're seeing that temperatures are hitting a maximum with carbon dioxide about every 100,000 years or so. Now that's consistent with those natural Milankovitch cycles that we talked about um, just about 10 minutes ago. Now. The other thing you notice from this graph is that temperature and carbon dioxide are tightly coupled. As one goes up, the other goes up, and as one goes down, the other goes down. That's consistent with the heat trapping nature of carbon dioxide and what we understand about the science of greenhouse uh, warming, but it's nonetheless important and reinforcing to see it here reflected in the data. Now, this is where we are, uh, where we were in 1950, in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, that blue line. But it's where we've come since 1950 as we've continued to burn more coal, oil, gas for the, again, to power our cars and electricity and power our society. That has really got us, you know, scientists and entire nations and people concerned about climate change. And that's where we are today. In just a 70 year period, we have basically gone off the charts here in terms of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere as, um, you look at this graph, we're about 50% higher now than any of these prior 100,000 year maxima. Now I could extend this graph to nearly a million years and you'd see the same cycle. That is at no point was carbon dioxide ever higher than about 280 parts per million. And again, just in a 70 year period, we've gone 50% higher than this cycle, the maximum that we've seen throughout this cycle. And this is very concerning. Where temperatures, this red line are gonna go is really any climate modeler's best estimate and it's what people's entire careers are currently dedicated to trying to understand. Now we know that uh, signs all point to warming and indeed over the last few decades as we've really ramped up CO2 emissions, we've been seeing carbon dioxide and temperature go up and up and up. This is just, uh, since this talk, based in California. I wanted to show you what California has been doing in terms of temperature over the last century or so. Um, you can actually go to on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration website to look at any state in the country to see how temperatures have been changing. Now it's not just temperatures that are changing 
uh, every climate indicator uh, that we, we follow is pointing in the same direction. So if you look at the top, you're looking at temperatures, but if you look at the middle, we're seeing um, average sea level, which has been going up consistent with the bottom chart, which is what snow cover has been doing, uh, going down. So as we've been melting more ice, as, as ice has been melting uh, at the poles, we've been seeing some of that water trickle into the oceans, which has been contributing to sea level rise. And we've also been seeing a thermal expansion of the oceans, which has been contributing to sea level rise. This is just a picture of the North Pole from 1979 to 2000. You can see just how dramatic the melting of ice has been across the North Pole. Greenland melting, um, dramatic as well. This comparison here, a little dated, but we are seeing the same trend continue, which is basically a dramatic thawing of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, Greenland, Greenland ice sheet is absolutely massive with parts of the ice sheet that are as thick as a mile. And the melting of this is enough to dramatically inc uh, increase sea level rise, which I'll talk about in the second portion of this talk. Um, pictures like this are all over the internet. You can Google them yourself. So look at uh, different images from the early 1900s to today and see uh, previously glaciated areas that have turned into lakes and beaches, essentially. Um, I have visited Glacier National Park uh, about uh, 10 years apart, visited there twice, and you are indeed seeing glaciers melt. The Glacial, Glacier National Park, um, of course, was named by the abundance of glaciers at the park. This is up in Montana. Um, but we're only seeing about 29, I think the number was over 100 at one point, 29 active glaciers up in Glacier National Park now. So sea level rise, uh, it's been going up, but more important than just this simple fact that it's been going up is how the rate has been changing. If you look at the 1900s, the rate of sea level rise was about a one and a half millimeters per year. And if you look at the more recent decades, uh, you're seeing about a doubling of that rate. And that's concerning as we head into the future, you know, these rates are not fixed and they really depend on how much we're continuing to emit greenhouse gases and warm the planet. Um, it, when we think about projections of sea level rise, we really can't assume that these rates that we currently are seeing are gonna be the same in 10, 20 years. We might see a, another doubling of the rate of sea level rise. And sea level rise is really one of those um, examples of where the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is basically the authority on climate science, is um, has been actually too conservative. So their estimates on where in the 90s of where we would be in terms of sea level rise turned out to be um, basically very conservative. We're at the highest uh, sort of rate that they would have that they predicted at that time. So the business as usual path of greenhouse gas emissions is consistent with the worst case scenario that we predicted in the 90s, 1990s. Um, in terms of sea level rise, about half of the sea level rise that we're seeing is from melting glaciers. And the other half is, as I mentioned, thawing of the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, warming of the oceans. So when you, if you ever took a chemistry class in high school or college, you were taught that uh, liquids don't change their volume, whether you compress them or fan them. Turns out that's not entirely true. Um, they do increase in volume slightly when you warm them up. Now, it's not something you'd ever notice in your cup of tea, but it's something that is measurable at the Earth's surface at the, uh, when you have a whole entire ocean uh, that's warming. We do see sea level rise due to the warming of the oceans. Now, is it just carbon dioxide? Uh, no, it's not. It's also methane and nitrous oxide, these other really important greenhouse gases, and they're all just about following the same trajectory. This is a trajectory that looks very similar to population growth over time. So basically, as we've uh, industrialized, as we've added more humans to the planet, we've been increasing our agriculture, increasing our combustion of oil and uh, cutting down of forests, and all of these things contribute to these three gases building up in the atmosphere. Um, so it's, uh, it's something that's, that's visible in men, no matter really which way you cut the pie here. Now, I just mentioned some other greenhouse gases. Uh, are they important and to what extent are they important? Well, I think I've already said that they're important, but I wanna show you to what extent they're important. So what you have here is these different greenhouse gases, the extent to which they're contributing to carbon, uh, to global warming. Now, carbon dioxide, we talk about mostly and consider the most important greenhouse gas, not because it's the most 
potent greenhouse gas. And by potent, I mean um, how well it can absorb heat and trap heat. It turns out that methane, in fact, and even uh, is about 30 times uh, better at trapping Earth's radiation than carbon dioxide. And nitrous oxide, which comes from agricultural uh, processes, is about 270 times stronger than carbon dioxide. So the reason these aren't the most important greenhouse gases is not because they're not uh, very potent, strong heat trappers. It's just because they're not as concentrated in the atmosphere. Um, a lot of our activities, a lot of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions are due to uh, the burning of fossil fuels and that's why carbon dioxide is so concentrated and why we mostly focus on that but these other ones are important um i'm actually gonna let's see i'm, I'm just gonna sum this slide up by saying that um, scientists have looked closely at these different gases and particles in the atmosphere to understand their physics and the extent to which they contribute to either cooling or warming on the planet. And when you put these things together, such as sulfate aerosols, stratospheric ozone, um, greenhouse gases, you can basically look at the extent to which um, they're contributing to, like I said, cooling or warming. And anything that's falling above the line in, in sort of the yellowish, orangish colors, that's contributing to warming. And the magnitude of the bars is, uh, is reflecting to what extent it's contributing to warming, given the concentrations in the atmosphere. And you can see that, you know, there's some cooling effects and some warming effects. And when we add them up together, that's how we understand whether we can expect net cooling or net warming on Earth. And as it turns out, that bar on the left is essentially swamping out all these other bars. And that is the bar of greenhouse gases. Um, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and other gases contribute significantly in the positive direction. And because of the concentrations in the atmosphere, the uh, magnitude of that bar is overwhelming and it overwhelms all these other uh, what we call climate forces. And given all that knowledge of what we know about these different processes and gases in the atmosphere, uh, we can estimate how the climate will change due to uh, either increasing or decreasing concentrations of these gases and come up with climate models. And essentially that's what I'm showing you here on the right is that putting our understanding of all these things together uh, scientists can project how climate will change and they can actually validate those prediction, predictions by um, sort of going back in time and uh, looking at data from the 1970s and 80s and 90s and trying to predict uh, what temperatures we're gonna, are going to do in the 2000s and in the you know, early 2000s and, and uh, compare those projections with what we know now is reality. And that's what you're seeing essentially up at the top is observed and modeled. And I'll just, um, just kind of using this, uh, this is a, a graph basically showing how long it would take for carbon dioxide to drop if we stopped emitting carbon dioxide today. Um, what you can see is you go from about 100% down to 20% in about 100 years. So it takes, what we do today is extremely important. It's gonna take about 100 years um, for 80% of that to wash out of the atmosphere, so to speak. Now, we don't go to zero notice. And if you want to get back to where we started, it takes on the order of thousands of years to go back to zero. Um, and that's because of some complex interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere. So the message here is basically, as I just said, um, what we do today is going to have very, very long term consequences. And we don't unfortunately get to just stop emitting gases and just go back to, you know, have everything go back to normal. Uh, we really need to think carefully about our activities today because we are committing to them. These one uh, is a really important, a really important uh, aspect that I haven't mentioned yet. And this is something that is difficult to model and it's difficult uh, to, it's kind of the X factor when we talk about climate change and it's what's known as positive feedback systems. Um, I'm just going to give you, there's no really great way, I think, to show you a, an image of a positive feedback. I just kind of have to explain it and show you a picture of the snowball effect. Um, if you think about a positive feedback, what it is is basically when a small, a small impact translates and gets basically into a runaway chain reaction to where we have a really big impact. Um, 
the example with climate change is so important. One of them is thinking about ice on the planet. If we think about the earth and the temperatures that we have here on earth, um, the temperature on earth is a, is basically a, is a reflection of basically the incoming and outgoing. It's a, it's a delicate balance of incoming and outgoing radiation. And if we think about the surface of the earth, we have ice sheets in the north and the south, the North Pole, South Pole, and those ice sheets are really important for reflecting sunlight. Now, as we add more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and heat up the Earth's, uh, the Earth, we start to melt away the, the ice. And what that means is there's less reflection of incoming solar energy. Now, forget about whatever led to the initial increase in temperatures. Just the fact that we've melted that ice now means we're going to perpetuate and have more warming because now there's less ice to reflect incoming sunlight. And as we get more warming, even more ice melts. And as more ice melts, even more warming ensues. So you can see it's this, this uh, delicate balance that can really easily um, get forced into a, a chain reaction of uh, basically an uncontrolled warming system. And that's really important to understand with climate change is that there's a point, uh, you may have heard the phrase tipping point, there is a point at which humans may no longer uh, have control over, over the climate system. Uh, we might decide in 50 years that we're gonna cut our greenhouse gas emissions. And by that point, since we've kicked in a, this positive feedback effect of melting ice that's perpetuating more warming and more melting, uh, it may be too late to really do much about global warming. So this is really important to understand. And there's plenty of uh, feedback systems. I talk about a couple of them uh, in my book, which I'll mention at, at the end of the talk. So if you've ever had a conversation about climate change, uh, you've had enough of them, you've talked to somebody who says, um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, well, Earth goes through natural cycles, uh, you know, this is going to be no different. Well, let's just assume for a second that that's true, that Earth goes through natural cycles, which it does, and that this is just another natural cycle, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, well, let's take a snapshot, let's take a, a little a tour through the Earth's history. Um, if we would go back 700 million years ago, we get to um, Snowball Earth. Now, Snowball Earth is basically um, is what Earth looked like when it went underwent a cooling effect. Again, about 700 million years ago, a runaway cooling effect. So what we had was a a uh, initial trigger that caused some gradual warming. Uh, sorry, gradual cooling at the North Pole and the South Pole, and ice sheets started to gradually spread across the Earth, and that led to the reflection of more sunlight, which perpetuated more cooling because there was less uh, sunlight getting retained, less energy. And then ice sheets grew even more and more as the Earth cooled, and then as they grew more and more, they reflected more light, and this runaway cooling effect uh, happened. It's actually estimated that this, this happened twice in Earth's history. Now that's one extreme of where Earth has been. Let's talk about another extreme. About 100 million years ago during the Cretaceous period uh, where the dinosaurs roamed the Earth, we had a runaway warming effect. Essentially, we had a hothouse. It's called a hothouse Earth. Now, there were no glaciers at all on the planet. There was no cold North Pole or, or icy South Pole. This was a 100% uh, liquid and uh, Earth. In fact, because no ice sheets were existing, there was a uh, sea levels were about 250 to 300 meters higher. This is enough ocean to inundate about a third of the present day land surface. So I kind of close these close with these slides um, as we talk about climate science because again it reinforces the importance of understanding that Earth has gone through some very wild climates in the past and it's true Earth will be around for whatever uh, is projected in the future. However, Human civilization has not uh, stood the test of time whatsoever, and we have not, society has not been around for more than 10,000 years, advanced society. And we have not, um, you know, we, we actually, uh, civilized advanced society has been around for a 10,000 year, very stable climatic period. Uh, we've seen very little climate variation. And it's therefore, important that we really try to do everything we can to ensure the continued stability of our climate rather than forcing it uh, towards destabilization, which I'm sad to say is what we're currently doing. Now, um, again, I don't say this to scare anyone, but just to show you that the earth has seen 
very dramatic climate swings in the past, and there's nothing that suggests that Earth can't uh, undergo another very dramatic climate swing. Again, we've seen snowball Earth, we've seen hothouse Earth. And you're hearing my uh, dog whining in the background, so I apologize. Okay, so now I wanted to just uh, show you one or two last slides. I mentioned that um, I could go back 800,000 years and you'd see a similar cycle about carbon dioxide. Um, this is that 800,000 year ice core uh, that was drilled. And this shows you basically that same patterning that uh, we get a peak of carbon dioxide about every 100,000 years. Here we are, uh, as you saw from 1950 to 2020, we've just shot way off the charts. Uh, it does not take a statistician to see this data, to see this graph and rec recognize that we've got something that we, uh, an anomaly and something that we've really got to be concerned about given what we know about the greenhouse effect and carbon dioxide. Um, it's no understatement or it's no overstatement rather to say that we are conducting a global experiment. That's literally what we're doing. Uh, there's there's uh, a lot of data that shows what Earth's climate has done over the past several million years. And uh, we have not seen a rapid CO2, uh, uh, growth in CO2 that has been this rapid, um, possibly ever, uh, potentially once about 60 million years ago. So this is what we're talking about. Now I'll just close, uh, if you want to screenshot this slide, um, this is basically sharing some, I think, really useful books, uh, some of which are, some are short, some are long. Uh, the Long Thaw by David Archer, Climate Casino, Storms of My Grandchildren, written by one of the foremost NASA scientists who was er the, one of the earliest scientists to speak out about climate change, testified on the floor of the Senate a couple of times. So these are good books that I would uh, recommend you pick up. Uh, the book that's um, not coincidentally uh, expanded the largest beyond debate, this is my book uh, that, I, that I wrote and was published two years ago. And what this book does, it's going to be sort of the basis actually of the second part of the talk as we shift gears here. Uh, but what this book does is essentially dives into 50 common climate misconceptions. Um, I basically, in 50 short chapters, summarize all of the things that you're likely to hear about why climate change isn't happening. And I'm debunking those misconceptions uh, with science, but it's not meant for the scientist to read. It's meant for the everyday person. There's over 170 references. Um, I try to make this book as uh, plain and simple as possible. It's not too convoluted. And uh, yeah, I think it's very useful for climate um, activists as well as climate skeptics. Uh, this book is not written in any kind of um, condemnatory tone. I think it's just important that we all talk about climate change and learn the, as much as we can about the topic and try to inform each other. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to now shift gears here. Um, I'm happy to take a couple questions since we are kind of, the talk is kind of divided up. Uh, Hillary, I'm happy to defer you on, on that. If you'd like to wait to the end, um, I'm happy to do that too. Um, we did get one question come in through the chat, which okay. was, um, did dinosaurs back then die because of the climate change pattern during their time? So that was talking about that hothouse earth that you mentioned? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the predominant hypothesis as to why the dinosaurs uh, went extinct has to do with a comet that hit the earth about 65 million years ago. Now. Um, it's important to recognize that the planet did undergo dramatic climate disruption because of that comet. So in some ways it was due to the comet. Um, it's interesting if you ask that question because I just finished reading a book that was um, delved into that topic in depth using the more most recent data. Um, and it's, it's hypothesized that about 50% of the dinosaurs, uh, interestingly, died probably within the first couple of days of the comet hitting. And uh, there were dramatic wildfires that would have uh, ensued after comet hit that would have helped to kill off the remaining 50% of the population over the next um, several months. Uh, but because of the comet and all these fires and, and the injection of aerosols into the atmosphere, uh, there was essentially something akin to what a nuclear winter is, which is uh, these aerosols blocking out the sunlight, which ends up killing off the vegetation, 
So your herbivores die first, and then your carnivores die after the herbivores uh, die. And what's interesting about the end of the dinosaurs is that they actually were, um, it, it, it appears that the dinosaurs were basically at their peak of their, of their reign, essentially. They were extremely, um, we had T-Rexes and, and these enormous species all over the planet. Uh, they were really at the height of their dominance and they crashed essentially overnight in geologic terms. And it's uh, important to understand that because um, again, there's really uh, nothing that, pre that precludes human beings uh, from undergoing a similar fate. And I think it's why it's really, of course, not from a comment necessarily, but it's really important to understand that uh, because we're here, doesn't mean that we're gonna be here forever. And we really need to take our climate seriously and take our environment seriously. Um, there's um, books that I don't have here on the end slide that uh, do talk about societies and human societies that have collapsed over time. And there's a variety of case studies that Jared Diamond has looked into in his book, Collapse, if you ever want to take a look at that. Um, so thanks for that question. If there's any more, I'm happy to take them now or uh, I can move on if you want. Yeah, if anybody else has any questions, I can allow you to unmute yourselves. Okay. Um, I just have a question. Um, so, uh, she here, so I, just a question, you said that if we stopped putting CO2 into the um, atmosphere now, it would still take like, I don't know, 80 to 100 years, I don't know if that's exactly right, but, yeah. so what about programs that people are talking about to remove, you know, actively remove CO2, like I've been reading about, you know, this, uh, putting CO2 back into the soil and I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a good question. There's actually a documentary I just uh, watched last night. It just came out what is it? Um, called Kiss the Ground. It actually talks about all about- Oh, right, I've heard about uh, that, okay. All about uh, regenerative agriculture and the role that that can play in sequestering carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. I think it's extremely important to pursue um, objectives to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. However, they cannot be seen as the sort of, um, they, they can't be, let me rephrase this. If our pursuit of those, of those technologies and those uh, systems of, of um, processing agriculture or other you know, um, areas, if those have the effect of allowing a business as usual scenario in other aspects of society, for instance, oh, okay, well, we can continue to drive gasoline cars and burn coal and oil, um, then that's not a good thing. So these things have to be pursued in tandem. Um, we're not unfortunately going to get saved by these, you know, carbon se sequestration objectives. We really need to stop emitting CO2. So those two things really need to be uh, taking place in tandem. Uh, great question. All right, so why don't we shift into part two. Um, share my screen again here. All right, so this, as I mentioned, is um, talking, this part of the talk is more along the lines of climate impacts and observations as uh, I experienced them and observed across the country, traveling for uh, across 42 different states over uh, through 2018 and 19. And I didn't do this by myself. Uh, I was with my fiance, as I'll uh, mention, and you'll see some photos of the two of us. But I structured this talk somewhat in line with my book, Beyond Debate. So we're gonna kind of introduce some of these concepts uh, at first as misconceptions and then explain why they're misconceptions and then um, you know, share, share some of what we saw around, around the country. So this was the first route uh, that we took. So this was in 2018 across 36 states. Uh, we came back, rested up, and in 2019, uh, the two of us launched this other leg, which traveled through 16 different cities over about uh, six weeks or so. So On the Road for Climate Action was the name of our um, project. And uh, so let's dive in. So some of this is going to reinforce what we just learned and talked about in the previous part of the talk. Um, Earth's natural cycles explain recent warming. Is that true? Uh, well, we know that that's not true. That's a misconception. And we know that because of the length of which cycles we've talked about. 
Again, these are cycles that operate on tens of thousands of year time scales, but they fail to explain the rapid increase in temperatures that we've been seeing over recent years. Um, we talked about the greenhouse effect, uh, CO2 going up over recent time, largely because of coal, oil, and gas. Uh, there's the, another misconception that we sometimes hear, which is that we don't know what prehistoric temperature and carbon dioxide were like. Uh, you know, that's not the case either, right? Because we talked about this, this data that goes back hundreds of thousands of years, uh, drilling into ancient ice cores and understanding how CO2 has changed over time. And, and again, that 70 year period, we've really gone off the charts there. So what's gonna to happen to temperatures? Uh, as you saw, see, uh, temperatures are going up and up and up. Which brings us to why Athena and I went on the road for climate action. So we started out west. This was August 1st, uh, not these images, but when we started, it was August 1st, 2018. And we started by going through Nevada, Colorado, um, and California. And the story of climate change out west, as you may know to some extent, is one of increasing temperatures, increasing aridity, uh, more wildfires, as we know very well this year and last year and the year before that. And not just, um, well, I should say that areas like California and much of the west, southwest particularly, are fire prone. California is a fire prone, fire prone state and a drought prone state. But what we're starting to see is uh, a different magnitude of these natural disasters. These are not fires that are just burning through the wild. These are fires that are burning entire towns. As we're seeing, um, this was paradise uh, up in California. And I've actually, as I was traveling through California, giving talks in 2019, I met some people in um, Redding, California that were basically it was right where the car fire took place. And I had people in my talk who had actually lost their home, two people who had lost their home in that wildfire. So wildfires have been getting more dramatic, but it's not just the news, it's not just hearsay. Uh, we see this in the data. Cumulative forest area burn uh, has been going up since the early 80s. And if we go forward from 2000, we see that the area of burn in the US has actually gone up with each passing time period. Now, scientists have looked carefully at the extent to which climate change has, uh, can explain the increase in temperature and in, in fires that we've seen over recent history. And what they've arrived at is that approximately half of today's wildfires would have been avoided had we not been going up and up and up in temperatures over recent times. So here's a snapshot of the West, large wildfires that have been increasing across the West. We've seen about a four-fold increase in major wildfires over the last few decades. About a six times increase, a six-fold increase in the area burned by these major wildfires. And an increase, dramatic increase, of over 70 days in the wildfire season in the West. Now the season is when the first wildfire starts to when the last wildfire gets put out. That's grown by about three months, almost three months if you can imagine that, in just a few decades. Now, I want to mention one thing about before we kind of move to other uh, climate related impacts is that the number of, of fires has not necessarily changed. Um, now, that's important to understand because the ignition sources, and you hear this come up a lot when we're talking about fires and climate change, um, people get really uneasy about the thought that climate change is responsible for the wildfires that we're seeing, at least some of the wildfires. We can never say that there's a climate fire, so to speak. It's just a pattern that you've got to observe over time. Now, um, the reason why it's important to note that the number of fires have not been changing really is because uh, the ignition sources it, have always been there and will always be there, whether it's lightning strikes and people uh, flicking a cigarette into the road or what have you. Um, the ignition sources are always around. The question is, why are these small fires turning into just mega fires and burning record areas of uh, forest? Why are they becoming so much more difficult to put out? And that's where the increasing uh, temperatures and the increased aridity uh, really comes into play. So it's important to, to bear this in mind when we talk about uh, climate change. As we got to Colorado, by the way, we were still inundated with 
wildfire uh, smoke in 2018 as we got all the way up to Wyoming and nearly into Colorado. This was from the California Mendocino complex fire. Uh, these wildfire smoke related plumes really have far reaching uh, impacts. Now, when we got to, uh, this is actually Utah, we observed climate um, related impacts in the forest. Now this is the bark beetle. Uh, this is the bark, this bark beetle is a native beetle to this area, uh, but it really impacts the forest and it has a role in climate change and it has, it, its story has to do with climate change. But rather than tell you myself, I'm actually gonna take you to Colorado and, and share with you the, uh, share with you a snapshot of my visit to, uh, so I was just talking about Utah, but Rocky Mountain National Park is where this next clip is shot. And this is a video of my visit to Rocky Mountain National Park interviewing one of the rangers there who took us on a three hour tour of the area and explained to us the bark beetle uh, and what it has to do with climate change. So let me click play on this video and uh, all right so let me share my screen here this is my website by the way I'll introduce you to this a little bit more as we um, get closer to the end of the talk uh, but you can find all kinds of climate related videos here on my website so this is uh, again Rocky Mountain National Park on our way to document the bark beetle uh, destruction in the Colorado Starting to see some logical Can you all see the video? You're seeing the correct screen? Okay. At Rocky Mountain National Park with Chelsea, a very informative, uh, informed ranger, telling us about the bark beetle impacts to the park. I'm holding a little sample of, uh, of two bark beetles. They're about the size of a grain of rice. Very small, but not uh, insignificant. Uh, Chelsea, can you tell us a little bit about what we're standing next to and um, basically a little bit about the bark beetle's impacts to the park? Yeah. So we are standing right near one of the lodgepole pine trees of Rocky Mountain National Park. This is a tree that has grown up in Rocky. It's a native tree to the area. The beetles are also a native tree to the area. And this is a preferred host to what we refer to as the mountain pine beetle. So as a mountain pine beetle emerges in the summer, it can come into these trees. It bores through the bark of the trees, hence the name bark beetle. If a tree is healthy enough, it can pitch that beetle out using its sap. But unfortunately, of conditions within our forest so a lot of these trees aren't healthy enough to do that um, and they succumb to the beetle. The beetle gets inside the tree, gets into the bark, it spreads a fungus to the bark which will eventually overwhelm the tree. Now uh, if you tell viewers what does this have to do with climate change and how is climate change uh, leading to more bark beetle destruction? So climate impacts have a big role in bark beetle and the epidemic levels of bark beetles that we're seeing in the park. When the beetle bores into a tree, it can lay eggs, those eggs will larvate, and those larvae will then stay underwintered in the, in the bark. And if it's cold enough temperatures in the wintertime, the larvae have potential to be frozen out, they'll die, and they won't emerge the next year's health. But we haven't seen cold enough temperatures in our winter times in Rocky Mountain National Park since the early 80s. So without that cold temperature, that means that all the beetles are able to become adults. The next year, they'll become an the adult form, they'll fly out of the tree, they'll find an impulse tree, and they'll get into that tree, spread the fungus, and the cycle goes on and on and on to the point now that we're seeing epidemic levels. Wow, thank you. Uh, we're about to tour uh, a little bit through uh, some higher elevation and capture some of the footage of the widespread bark beetle destruction of the forest. However, uh, right now we're going to get out of the rain because uh, it's starting to come down on us. Thanks.
So this says here that bark beetles have caused widespread tree mortality on roughly one fifth of Colorado's forest land over the past two decades. So this is an incredibly important, important problem. Get back to my uh, screen here. So of course, it's not a life size uh, picture of the beetle. As you just learned, it's about the size of a grain of rice. Now these trees here, this is what we saw as we were driving up to the upper reaches of Cedar Breaks National Monument in uh, upper Utah. It was sad to see that, you know, this firsthand, this destruction of trees. And because it's a national monument, there's actually plaques out there that explain that this is in fact what we're seeing. This is the bark beetle uh, epidemic. And, but really this is uh, an image that paled in comparison to what we saw when we got to the top of the ridge, uh, which still shocks me to this day. Um, and this is basically a view of the surrounding hillsides that were basically just barren, white, uh, toothpick or matchstick like uh, skeletons of their former selves, really. This is not a deciduous forest in the winter. This is an evergreen forest in the summertime. And it's uh, not only sad, but this gets right back to the issue that we were talking about earlier, which is wildfires. This is perfect kindling for a future major wildfire. And that's really the case of a lot of climate impacts that we cover and talk about is they're really interrelated and can't be isolated. So the bark beetle, wildfires, um, infectious disease, so on and so forth. Uh, this is a slide that I also used to really reinforce to young people that, um, you know, this is, climate change is not an issue that's of, for the next generation or it's gonna affect the next generation. This is really a today problem and now problem and it's a problem uh, of this generation. So this notion that CO2 is good for plants, therefore it must be good for agriculture uh, is, is sorely misplaced. So let's talk about the impact of climate change on agriculture. This is Athena, my um, fiance and partner on the road for climate action. As we interviewed farmers in South Dakota, Minnesota, Massachusetts, and elsewhere, uh, we learned a lot about the impacts that farmers are experiencing already. Let me just share these two graphs really quickly to show you that soybean and corn, which are two mainstay crops across the Red Basket of the United States, um, they don't, they're already grown at optimum temperatures in the United States and they don't fare better, they in fact fare worse as you increase the thermostat. Um, we also have issues of flooding. If you look at and follow the news across the Midwest, Torrential record breaking once in every 500 year storms seem to be happening every few years. I interviewed a farmer in Minnesota who uh, told me about a storm that hit a couple years back and it dropped 20, uh, let's see, 17 inches of rain in a 24 hour period. I asked him what that was like and he said it was like hillsides collapsing, trees uh, flowing down the roadway. He's uh, the person who leased his land at the time, the lower part of the hill. Uh, had a potato farm and he lost all of his potatoes. They got uncovered, contaminated, and he had a contract with Whole Foods that he, of course, could not meet. So this is just a, a real, you know, this is real life for these people in the Midwest. Um, and concerns as we got to the East Coast, the Northeast, Boston, the Eastern Seaboard, really started to include sea level rise. And this photo I actually took with my own camera. This is the southern part of Florida. This is, um, i trying to remember the exact town. It's a little bit north of Miami. And what you're looking at is what's called sunny day flooding. And this is not a precipitation event. This is actual a king tide, a high tide that happens every few months. Uh, these tides are getting higher and higher. We're also having issues of, of land subsidence in these areas. And what you're getting is basically the ocean starting to envelop and take over these southern uh, areas. Um, this was about six inches of ocean water that had come up from the storm drains, flooding the streets and the, the neighborhoods. But we were told by people, and there was actually a news reporter in the area, that this was actually a pretty mild uh, flooding event. That the last one, a couple months back, the water levels were about knee high, uh, covering almost covering the fire hydrants. Um, so again, climate change, uh, not a, an issue for, you know, that's going to affect just the next generation. This is today and now, and this is something that we're going to continue to observe throughout our lifetime. Uh, but something we also need to try to mitigate to the extent that we can. So I mentioned earlier the Greenland ice sheet. 
the massive ice sheet uh, atop Greenland. If that Greenland ice sheet were to melt, uh, what would that do to, how would that exacerbate the sea level rise problem? Well, there's a pretty famous calculation that if that whole ice sheet were to melt, it would uh, increase sea levels by about six meters, around 20 feet or so, just that single ice sheet. Now, this is not going to happen tomorrow or next year, but we're seeing record melting at the Antarctic and record melting in Greenland. And this is something, of course, when we talk about climate change, we're concerned not just about uh, this year, but we're considered concerned about next year and generations to come. Now, the oceans are undergoing massive change due to temperatures and carbon dioxide as well. Uh, coral reefs, uh, potentially one of the first full ecosystems that can be wiped off the face of the planet uh, under a by 2100. This is coral reefs that are increasingly going like this to this to this. This is a um, coral reef that's under stress due to temperature and, and acidity and this is a, a coral reef that has come to that stress and ultimately died. In 2016 we saw a record mass bleaching event. This is called coral bleaching. Uh, that took place around the world's oceans due to a global warming event in the oceans where many oceans reached higher temperatures than had previously been recorded. And these coral reefs are already in the warmest oceans uh, in the world and they can't sus uh, subsist in much warmer temperatures. So this is something that is increasingly problematic as we start to warm up the globe. And of course, hurricanes, uh, we seem to be seeing it increased frequency, record-breaking hurricanes occurring more often. Uh, the, at the time that I gave this talk, there were a couple of hurricanes that actually, I'm sorry, at the time that I went on the road, there were actually record-breaking hurricanes that occurred along the path that we traveled. Um, now, what's the relationship between hurricanes and climate change and temperature? Well, as temperatures, uh, let me back up, hurricanes get their energy from warm surface, uh, warm ocean waters, surface ocean waters. And as we heat up the Earth's surface, those surface waters uh, get warmer and they feed into the hurricanes and essentially uh, fuel larger and larger hurricanes. So as we warm up the oceans and warm up the planet, the, there's an increased likelihood effectively that, we, that a category two or three hurricane can become a category three or four or even five hurricane. And if the last few years is any indicator of what we have to look forward to with the future, um, it's very concerning as it relates to, to hurricanes. Hurricane Michael, Largest hurricane to ever hit the panhandle of Florida came through in October 2018 and I was about three days away from it. In fact, we traveled through the panhandle right after that hurricane hit. This is our little car with our brandishing our little logo on the side. Um, it was really difficult to put into words what we observed as we delved into that area. Uh, not only were human structures completely wrecked from the hurricane, but entire forests were wiped out. Uh, you're looking at a pine forest that is essentially no more. Uh, these trunks were snapped about 10, 15 feet above the trunk. Um, now, there's a something that you hear sometimes in the politicians say, uh, reducing emissions is too costly. We often hear the cost of climate action uh, invoked as a reason to kind of not pay attention and not care because, oh, it'll be too expensive. Uh, really, really misguided uh, concept and, and approach. We've really got to consider the actual cost of climate change today and how it's going to continue to mount over time and then compare it to the cost of climate action. Um, so this is a, a gross misconception that fails to really look at the cost of climate change. So I'm going to share some of those costs with you right now. Uh, the United States actually keeps a record of what are called billion dollar disasters. These are uh, natural disasters. These are uh, for floods, hurricanes, mudslides, wildfires. Um, these natural disasters that hit the U.S. and cost a billion dollars or more to the U.S. economy, these are logged in this list. Uh, the list goes back to 1980. Um, so let me show you how things have changed. You can kind of visually see how these billion dollar disasters have mounted over time. Well, let's talk about um, let's put some numbers to this. So we had $28 billion disasters in the 80s, 52 in the 90s, 59 in the early 2000s. And I didn't, I got to update this slide, but we're over 100 by the time I updated this at the end of, uh, towards the end of 2019. Now, the costs associated with these have been enormous, $170 billion in the, fir the first decade, $266 billion, $500 billion, 
and getting close to a trillion dollars um, per decade to address these natural disasters. Now, we can only guess that the wildfires that have unfolded over from California over the last few weeks are going to put 2020 at another record-breaking year. Um, so these are, this is just one small glimpse of the climate problem as it relates to costs that we can look at. Um, this doesn't even talk about the public health related costs uh, from all the actual air pollution that's coming from coal and oil and gas that we're burning. Now, you might hear all this and think, um, isn't it too late for the climate? And my answer is no, it's, it's absolutely not too late for the climate. And I just want to share this one uh, graph which shows you projections for sea level rise uh, by the end of the century. Now, these projections, whether we're about a, a foot above sea level, a foot higher sea level by 2100, or we're uh, six or eight feet above sea level by 2100. These projections are, are driven by assumptions about how we take action. If we take action and we curb our emissions dramatically, then we head towards the lower, uh, the lower sea level rise estimates. If we continue down business as usual, continue to expand coal, oil, and gas, uh, continue to do agriculture the way we do agriculture and, and emit a, a greenhouse gases in that fashion, then we're gonna see sea levels uh, rising at the upper sort of limit according to these projections. So um, this is exactly why it's important to not uh, consider climate change a wash because it's not um, binary. It's not yes or no. It's not it happens or it doesn't. There are different degrees to which it occurs and that's where we really need to something we really need to keep in mind and it should really give us uh, um, cause to take action. Now, I'm only one person. There's nothing I can do. This is a misconception, but I'm actually going to shift slides to, uh, to get into climate solutions because I think ha after hearing all of this, you're probably itching to hear uh, some optimism and, and how we can actually all take part in, in addressing this problem. Uh, before I do that, I had meant to drop this in the chat uh, much earlier, but I'm going to just drop it in right now. So um, this is some. This is all details related to uh, me and how you can learn more information about um, what I do, how you can su subscribe to my monthly newsletter, which I send out at the end of each month. And also uh, something I offer to all of the, the groups I give talks to is uh, this link where you can, if you want to pick up a copy of my book, Beyond Debate, you can do so through this link uh, and not pay for shipping. So essentially it's free shipping. Um, and I also have an Instagram, uh, which I, as Hillary knows, I'm very active on and I try to use social media a lot really to try to inspire people and try to, um, you know, keep people thinking about climate change and the environment. So I encourage you if you have an Instagram to go ahead and click follow and stay tuned uh, far beyond today to this uh, topic. So uh, let me shift gears now into climate solutions. So this is a slide of a presentation, part of a presentation I recently prepared for my students at Chapman University, and I'm going to give you a little bit of it here. So how do we combat climate change? Well, I think the direct answer is, is obvious. We need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we can do that by obtaining electricity from solar, wind, uh, nuclear, and other zero emission sources. I recognize that nuclear is very contentious, uh, but we have to keep in mind I'm talking about climate change here. And if we're thinking strictly about climate change, it is a, a, um, a zero emission energy resource. And we also need to stop deforestation. So essentially what this is saying is we need to stop emitting greenhouse gases and we also need to stop uh, killing off the species that are helping to se sequester greenhouse gases, which is our forests. And uh, reduce global consumption and energy use, those play into this. We need to uh, you know, keep in mind our own behaviors and how we can uh, stop consuming, consuming, consuming. We're a very growth, 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 consumption-based society, and that's simply unsustainable. So we need to really think critically about that. Uh, sustainable farming practices, as uh, we talked about earlier, will definitely play a role. And uh, there's been technologies such as carbon capture and sequestration, which are, um, potentially useful, but it's important to understand that taking gases out of a coal burning power plant and sequestering them underground uh, is not a technology that's been proven over the long term. 
um, and therefore I don't think we should use it as a crutch. So reducing global greenhouse gas emissions is one avenue, but then removing CO2 from the atmosphere through technology is uh, another. Uh, one of the most innovative technologies out there is actually just planting a tree. Um, you know, I, I say that facetious, and we don't have to necessarily invent our way out of this. We can start by planting and reforesting our earth. We've done so much deforestation of the earth's surface over the last century and a half, couple centuries. Uh, we really need to start replanting our forest. And of course, there's the technological aspect too. Um, if you check out some of the videos on my website, there's an interview with a scientist at Harvard. His name is uh, David Keith, who's leading a company called Bioengineering, who's actually um, scaling, built, he's recently built a pilot plant in Canada that is actually extracting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, converting it into usable fuel that can go in your car. Uh, now that is just, I think, astounding. And what that basically means is that we may not have to reshape our entire automobile fleet to be electric. We could potentially um, keep, you know, people don't have to necessarily do away with their cars. Uh, we don't have to necessarily do away with all the automobile manufacturing plants. If we can actually extract carbon out of the atmosphere instead of extracting carbon out of the um, underneath the Earth's crust, we're essentially driving net zero vehicles and we're, we're kind of recycling the carbon in the atmosphere. Um, it's not the only solution that we should pursue, but I think it's an exciting piece of innovation. So I'm now going to share with you what I consider. These are my personal three pillars of climate action, what I view to be the most uh, important pillars of climate action. And they are listed in order. And I think civic engagement is the first thing that we need to think about and do. And then outreach and education, which we're all a part of today. And then individual carbon footprint. Why is individual carbon footprint at the bottom? Uh, it's because it's something we've been talking about for a long time and many people are aware of, but it's really not getting us where we need to go as it relates to climate change. Uh, that's where, why civic engagement is up top. Uh, we really need to care about who is uh, making decisions at the, at the uh, state, local and federal level. And what we really need are um, systemic policies that are gonna help us uh, help incentivize green innovation and help get us off of this fossil fuel addiction. So to expand on civic engagement, um, we need really badly environmental policy that is going to address climate change. Uh, this happened in the 1970s and it really helped the nation clean up its air in terms of atmospheric pollution that was bad for human health. Um, carbon monoxide, lead emissions, sulfur dioxide, which was causing acid rain, um, particulate matter, these were all regulated very uh, seriously in the 1970s and had a really dramatic positive effect uh, in cleaning up the atmosphere. California went from a really polluted state in the 70s to much, much cleaner today. Los Angeles is much, much cleaner because of these policies. Um, and we need something like that for climate change. We need to uh, basically pass climate related policy that's gonna uh, shift us off of uh, basically emitting uh, awful gases into the atmosphere that are disrupting the climate. We can engage civically by writing letters, by phone calls, by meeting with elected officials about supporting climate policies that already exist or are on the table of Congress. I encourage people to reach across the uncomfortable aisle. Uh, this is uh, me with former, former, um, former Congressman Dan Rohrbacher, who was a congressman over many of the beach cities in Southern California. And then this is current Congressman uh, Carly Ruda, who has a copy of my book. They both do. I don't know which one or if either of them read it, but they both have copies of my book. The point is that um, reaching across the aisle, these, this one was a Democrat, one's a Republican, and we really need to you know, try to get past politics if we're going to try to address climate change and um, try to connect with one another rather than considering each other as enemies. Uh, voting in elections is just so crucial. We have an election coming up. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but you need to look at, uh, in my opinion, the perspective that the candidates are taking on climate change, and they're very different. And you need to, uh, I think, I think we all need to consider this at the federal and local state levels, um, because we need to be sending people to uh, Washington and to the state houses who believe in climate change and who care about doing something about climate change. 
Uh, regulatory strategies do exist. Um, there's economic uh, instruments such as carbon fee and dividend. Basically, a carbon fee and dividend is basically saying that we need to charge um, carbon polluters a fee for pollution. And that's a pretty straightforward concept that we've applied in other settings such as um, hazardous waste. It costs money to produce hazardous waste and to drop it off at a hazardous waste landfill. Uh, we've been unfortunately not applying that to the atmosphere. So consequently, industry has been able to treat the atmosphere like an open, open waste dump for a very long time. And that's why we've really gotten uh, the place that we are where the atmosphere has been very polluted by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And we, I, uh, a really important um, concept which econ economists, environmentalists uh, agree on is we need to start charging a fee essentially to pollute the atmosphere to offer that disincentive. And then there's what are called command and control policies, um, fuel automobile fuel efficiency standards, which are known as CAFE standards is one example of that, um, the clean power plan. So these are different ways that we can address climate change through economic policy and also through command and control um, pollution policy. Uh, many policies already exist, but they need support from constituents. And that's where I think we all need to get uh, actively engaged on this issue. Um, again, I mentioned voting, but I don't, tell you to vote Democrat or Republican. I just say uh, vote for, sorry, this is my elephant, this is my donkey. Um, I just say vote for the climate, vote for Earth, because when we are voting for our Earth, we're voting for all the people that inhabit the Earth, uh, you, me, and all the plants and animals. We're so interdependent on the environment. It's The environment is not some other entity that doesn't include us. It includes us and it's extremely, its health is extremely important. And climate change is so important when we think about um, voting. Outreach and education. So we can really raise awareness about the problem and the solutions. Uh, you can talk to your community, much like I'm having this conversation with all of you today. You can take this information. You can send me an email at Sue if you want any help and try to take a presentation to your neighbors, to your own communities. I've given talks um, in size that range from three people to 1,200 people. So I encourage you to, to not um, exclude any groups. Talk to as many people as you can churches, schools, all kinds of things. You can talk, uh, you can use flyers, door to door, social media. Uh, social media is so important. This is us talking to, Athena and I talking to a group of sixth graders in Connecticut. Um, I was actually, had this whole climate presentation planned for them. And the first question I actually asked the students before I really delved into the talk was, uh, how healthy do you think planet Earth is right now? And one of the kids raised his hand and said, I don't think Earth is very healthy because we've been uh, burning coal and oil to power society, which has been producing greenhouse gases, which is causing climate change. And I thought, well, great, there went my whole talk. Um, but yeah, they were a very smart, bright group of kids. And I think it's really great to just get out to your community and try to talk about these problems because quite frankly, we don't solve problems that we don't talk about. And there's another aspect of outreach and education, which I think is often overlooked. And that is the part uh, that is serving as a role model for others. I don't think it's sufficient to be stewards of the environment in a silo, in a vacuum. I think we need to um, be proud of the environmental uh, measures that we're taking to, uh, you know, and, and share those uh, with our, our friends and neighbors and explain to them, you know, why is it that I'm riding my bike to work or why is it that I'm not using my air conditioning? Uh, you know, I think that we need to to not be so modest and, and try to incentivize others and, and really encourage others to, um, to basically be more climate friendly and environmentally friendly without asking them to do so. I, I think people don't like to be asked to do things, but when they see that you're doing something and you're really excited about it and you're proud of it and you're doing good, uh, people want to emulate that. And I think that's where you know, serving as a role model is so important. I already mentioned that climate change has kind of become this incendiary topic. It's sort of the Republicans versus Democrats. Uh, but again, we only solve the problems we want to talk about, which is why I think it's just so critical to try to the extent that we can to trans transcend this uh, sort of dilemma, this awkwardness at the dinner table to not talk about climate change. Uh, we can also do awareness through social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all great avenues through which we can reach our peers and colleagues. Um, there's been some some literature on you know what changes people's minds is it um 
And there's all kinds of different things that influence a person. But the number one influencer oftentimes is actually just people's uh, friends and family. So, uh, you know, if, if you're, whether it's at home or just through social media, sharing in, important information about the climate is on social media is, is really, I think, an important thing to do. Uh, we can still use these platforms to share pictures of our cats and dogs and our fa family and friends, but um, every now and then, as often as possible, without being annoying, <laughs> uh, just dropping, reposting an article by NASA or NOAA or the EPA showing the tundra melting in the dead of winter. These kinds of headlines need to be the headlines that we're also seeing on social media because uh, it's, it's very true that a lot of people get their news from Facebook and social media. This is actually a graph that um, is a product of information I collected across about 500 people around the country. And the results are not actually that shocking, but they're important, which is if you look at, um, ask people where you get, what's your number one news source, Facebook uh, or, or the newspaper, or what's your biggest news source? College students, more of them report using Facebook as their number one source compared to the newspaper relative to the general public. So younger people, college people uh, getting a lot of their news from Facebook. This doesn't mean, by the way, that they're getting their news from uh, basically people's comments and stories. Uh, there's a lot of news articles these days that are being shared on social media. So those the sharing of, uh, you know, Washington Post, New York Times through social media is now a big avenue for which people encounter these papers and articles. Um, there's a beautiful story in that, that is, we don't all have to be news reporters. Uh, we don't have to get a job at the New York Times or Washington Post to be a news reporter. In this day and age, you can actually just share existing articles on your own Facebook page or social media page, and you will be informing, um, you're basically serving as a news reporter to your friends, to your community, the people who are friends with you on those social media pages. So I think it's really empowering. Um, this day and age that we have the ability to, uh, and, and it, of course this can go both ways, you know, you see a lot of junk online too, but you know, that's again where we can all try to filter, uh, dilute all the junk that's being shared on social media, all the, the news that is coming from spurious sources uh, by sharing, you know, actual science from, you know, NASA, again, NOAA, NASA, EPA, uh, and try to dilute some of the, the noise out there with some important information. Connecting the dots is so critical. I've talked about a lot of stuff today, um, but connecting the dots for our friends, neighbors, family is, is, a, is a critical aspect of sort of bringing this all home. We really think uh, that climate change is oftentimes separate from these other real world issues that we all care about, but they're so interrelated. This is a, just a snapshot of, um, to talk about the refugee crisis. We often hear about the refugee crisis being invoked in politics and in the you know political arena climate change is a refugee problem uh, there are actually more environmental refugees today than there are political refugees about a person every second is getting displaced from a, a fire a natural disaster a drought a flood um, and by 2050 that number is expected to go up dramatically so when we talk about refugees we're talking about climate change when we talk about the economy we're talking about climate change um, whether it's trying to get into a renewable energy economy, or whether it's the natural disasters that have been slamming the United States and the world, the economy and the climate are so interrelated. War and peace, um, places that are in turmoil, of course, breed terrorism. Uh, we, we're also, when we see shrinking freshwater resources uh, in areas that are sharing a border with five different countries, um, you know, the destabilization of the climate, disrupted agriculture, these things don't bode well for um, national security whatsoever. And in fact, the Pentagon, um, I've got the report shared on my website, the, the Pentagon identifies climate change as a threat multiplier. And it's really important to understand that uh, national security and climate are not separate. Jobs, homelessness, again, very interrelated with the climate. Um, so the more that we can connect the dots for our peers and our neighbors and friends, the that climate change is not separate from all these issues that we really care about, the more I believe that we're gonna to start to see real uh, momentum behind trying to address climate change. And this is re reinforced, um, the lack of connecting the dots is reinforced by this data that I collected um, on the road. So this is again, sampling around 500 people. 
uh, asking them what's your number one climate related concern uh, in black is what people responded was their number one climate related concern you can see that future generations here was the top uh, now i think this is for one thing important it's interesting for climate com communicators such as myself to um, I think it's an important message that we've got to do better at communicating that climate change is not a future generation problem. It's not just a problem for tomorrow. It's a today problem. It's a now problem. Um, however, what I think as interesting as all these peaks in the histogram are actually the areas that we see nothing, uh, very little reporting at all, actually. And these are those topics that I was just talking about, the economy, property value, national security, infectious disease, People seldom rated these as their top climate related concern. Meanwhile, uh, national polling suggests that economy and property value and national security are really, really big um, topics for Americans. And in fact, any presidential election will reinforce that and think about, look at the topics they talk about. So why are we seeing this reflected in the data here? I think this gets right back to what I was just talking about, which is uh, the importance of connecting the dots. We're still not connecting the dots between climate change and these really important issues that are listed here. So to the extent that we can do that for ourselves and also for our, our colleagues and friends, uh, again, I think the more that we're going to start to see a change in people's um, desire to, to act on climate change. And now to pillar three, and then we'll open it up to questions in about uh, 10 minutes or so. So carbon footprint, reducing your personal consumption, energy use, and waste. This is what we talk about when we talk about climate uh, carbon footprint. It's basically um, leaving a smaller footprint, so to speak, on the earth uh, through, your, through your own actions and behaviors. So home energy use, um, you know, some of this can be pretty familiar, but turning off the lights in the rooms that you're not using, changing out your light bulbs to be um, LED or compact fluorescent, and also importantly, especially as we incur these heat waves, uh, not blasting your AC too much. I recognize that um, you know people have different habits as it relates to AC. Uh, believe it or not, even when it hit 107, de 107 degrees uh, about three weeks ago, I did not have my AC on. I have not actually used my AC all year. <laughs> um, so I don't think we all have to be that extreme, but I mean, we really, I think, uh, need to take a look at our energy use, in fact, Energy, home energy use uh, is one of the big consumers of electricity nationally. So um, thinking about how you're running your AC on those really hot days is important, turning it down, uh, using a fan instead. Fans are much less energy intensive and you'll actually save money on all these uh, by making all these changes as well. Um, diet, really important, not always talked about. Um, this is one of the most Important. This is one of the most easily uh, easy ways that you can actually draw reduce your carbon footprint by thinking about what you eat. Now, if you ask, um, you know, what are the types of foods that can reduce reduce my uh, carbon consumption, so to speak, and are more car uh, carbon friendly, climate friendly? It's actually the same types of foods that your doctor would tell you you should be eating anyway because they're more healthy. That is, uh, fruits and vegetables and nuts. Eating lower on the food chain. Uh, animal agriculture places a tremendous burden on the planet through use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and um, the fact that a lot of uh, cattle ranching is done in areas done in areas that have to be deforested. Uh, when we saw the Amazon rainforest on fire uh, about a year ago, uh, not as often talked about, although I did write an article in the Hill on this very topic, is that a lot of that burning was due to farmers uh, basically doing slash and burn methods to expand agriculture. And that agricultural demand was largely, is largely in Brazil being driven by beef, um, beef demand. So demand for more cows leads to more cutting down of forests, uh, which leads to not only deforestation, but uh, more dramatic climate change. And then obviously public transportation, whether it's riding the bike or taking the bus are very important ways that you can reduce your carbon footprint. Uh, start a compost in your backyard, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle in that order. If you can avoid buying something, that's really a, a plus, that's a positive. If you can reuse something that you already own before buying something new, that's, that's great. And if you can't use it or reuse it, uh, don't throw it away if you can recycle it. So please do recycle. I attended a conference in uh, Atlanta 
it was a climate change theme. Um, so I was giving a talk on all these types of issues, that, but I learned something really important at that conference. At this, it was a reused, uh, a recycled textiles conference, very specific random type of conference. But I, I was shocked by the footprint that the textiles industry is leaving as relates to climate change. About 5% of global carbon dioxide emissions are actually from the textile industry. And there's this sort of concept of fast fashion, which is becoming more popular these days where people uh, basically are buying uh, pretty inexpensive clothes that are um, basically getting degraded in six months or a year. And then you buy another pair of clothes. It's kind of, it's cheap fashion. It's colorful. It's pretty, it's fast fashion. Um, but that, a lot of that's going to the landfill <clears throat> and we need to really try our best to think about the textiles that we're buying and um, try to not overconsume at all. A lot of this gets back to overconsumption. Uh, vote with your dollar. Every time you buy a product, uh, you are voting for that product to be in existence. Uh, so think very carefully about how you spend your money at the grocery store, uh, at the at any kind of store, at, even at the gas pump. Um, water is one example. Uh, we there's a movement to try to eliminate water bottles using these. But if you own 20 of these, then you're also part of the problem. So own one <laughs> and give those other ones away to your friend, friends and family. Uh, living in Southern California, I have I can't help but point out that we don't actually need our dryer. We'll save on electricity if you start hang drying your clothes. <clears throat> if you're like me and you don't want your clothes getting beat on in the sun because they'll fade very quickly, uh, you can buy something at Target that is something that you can hang dry. It's like a little um, rack that a lot of people use in Europe. Uh, you can hang a lot of clothes in a, s a small square footage of area and you can avoid having to use your dryer, which saves a lot of electricity, saves you money and saves the planet. And then planting a tree is just one of the easiest things you can do. Uh, we talked again about regenerative agriculture. So regenerating the agriculture, the land in your home is one way you can evoke change. Plant a tree, plant plants, farm, have a garden. Um, and uh, again, I, I put my money where my mouth is. I've been hang drying my clothes for about five years now. I, I virtually never use a dryer and it feels great. My clothes are just fine and it saves a lot of energy and, and we can all as a, as a group save a lot of energy if we committed today to trying to hang dry our clothes uh, even just half of the time. All right, uh, climate action groups. I've given you a lot of information today. Uh, it's hard to stay to you know, make every change. So one thing you can do, and you're all part of the uh, Newport Bay Conservancy, so you're already partly doing this, but just getting involved in organizations who are gonna keep these topics on your mind, who are gonna continue to expose you to things you can do to improve. Um, and I obviously, I mean, I shouldn't say obviously, but I, I also um, am working on projects. So feel free to email me if you ever want to get involved. Um, and this is actually just a remnant from a talk I gave to my students. So I'm going to skip past some of this. And uh, okay, so I'll just share with you my website really quickly. I'm actually going to exit this screen and take you back to the real uh, internet. So. I will uh, always be here on a Zoom call in front of you, but I have a website where you can all visit to stay in the loop. Um, if you just go to that website that I dropped in the link, uh, shahirmosry.com, uh, you can also normally access it for road for act, through roadforaction.com, but the uh, link's temporarily broken. So shahirmosry.com, I've got a lot of uh, information for you. Uh, you can also access any of my publications, whether it's my, um, book publication with some sample chapters and, and content or any of the you know news articles that i've written you, you can access all that the videos that i've shared with you if you cl click to the road for action um, i'm constantly bringing on new videos this one was last month um, these are from the time that i traveled around the country interviewing lots of individuals this was in peru um, so i encourage you to check that out there's a whole video archive please uh you know if you like the videos, share them on social media, um, subscribe to my YouTube. And then I'll also, sh I want to share with you this, uh, this resources tab, which is um, just got this new 
drop down menu with a tab for climate education. So if you want to become more active and more informed on the issue of climate change, I'm trying to make that as easy as possible through this, uh, this tab. And I've got climate reports. So these are the latest IPCC reports. I even mentioned the, the Pentagon report right here. You can click on any of these. I'm growing this all every month, every week. So uh, this will be changing. You'll be getting more information. Um, there's, if, if you're ever gonna give a presentation and you want fast facts uh, to build your presentation slides, click down here. I've got all the references about rising sea level uh, temperatures, carbon dioxide, snow and ice, sea level rise so on and so forth. Uh, if you're an Instagrammer, I create memes, which I encourage you to share on your Instagram page. Uh, so these are just talking about climate change, books, uh, different organizations you can get involved with, so on and so forth. So um, again, with that said, uh, I will open it up for questions. This is the homepage, by the way, I should have mentioned, uh, this is how you can subscribe to my monthly newsletter by just clicking the subscribe button which will bring you down here and you just got to enter your email address and uh, every month we'll get a newsletter with uh, content about the environment, climate change and health. Uh, all right, so that's all that I have for you. It looks like we're almost at about the uh, 20 minute remaining timeline, which is what I was going for. So happy to open it up now and take questions, uh, comments and hear from you. Yeah, before I let others unmute themselves, a few questions came through in the chat so we can go through those first. Um, there was a question from the middle section of your talk. Could the increase in wildfires be partly due to decrease in natural burns? Yeah, so uh, let, me, let me go to that slide really quickly. So um, there is uh, definitely a component to, there's a component of the natural burns, there's a component of um, population, uh, the interface, the, the interface with, uh, can you see my slides again? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go back to that burning slide here. Um, so there's a uh, component to, you know, more urbanization, more of this uh, people encroaching into the wild. And that's why actually, if you look at this slide here, you'll see that under the assumption of no climate change, you still see um, wildfires going up, right, year after year after year. So there would be a natural tendency of increasing wildfires because of what you mentioned, which is a, an important note of, uh, you know, controlling uh, the way that we manage our forests and also population increase of the urban rural interface. Um, so after considering all these things and uh, accounting for all those different variables that do contribute to wildfires, um, what scientists have come up with is that there's still this added fraction that is uh, due to climate change. So it, it's a great point and uh, hopefully I clarified that a little. Great. Um, the next question here was, how much difference does it make locally to lower CO2 emissions locally? Um, okay, so I'm trying to understand the question. So how much, how much, I think what I'm, what I'm understanding is how much does a local impact mean to like the global uh, issue? Is that sort of what you're getting at? I think, um, let me see if I can unmute Adila. Hi, that was a great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we talked about lowering CO2 and it's such a global issue, but you want to do something locally. There's local like ordinances and laws in California trying to go like all gasless cars. How much of a difference is it going to make in our local community if, as a local community, we are able to lower our CO2 output? So the difference to your local community is going to be small um, from a climate change standpoint. If you're, if you're thinking um, that every community is going to be affected by climate change, um, but we're essentially sharing the same atmosphere with the globe. So your community might do a lot to contribute to the problem, but if you're the only community that's doing anything, then it's not going to necessarily translate to much benefit to your community from a climate change standpoint if the rest of the world isn't doing anything, which is really why it's important to um, do everything you can as a community, but continue to try to encourage other communities to do the same because this really is um, something that's going to have to be pursued at a global level. Um, fortunately, it's not every community in the world that needs to take part because most of the emissions are attributed to a few different countries. Um, but it's also why we need some um, top-down 
policy instruments to help uh, us along the way. And, and it's why, uh, you know, if we want to see change of the magnitude that's necessary, we're going to need to see every buddy making, every community making dramatic changes uh, very quickly. And that's not going to just happen by chance. It's going to have to come through um, a, maybe a carbon uh, fee and dividend, which tells corporations that they have to charge more for uh, oil and gas because it's polluting the atmosphere. And by internalizing that cost, for example, um, it gives a comparative advantage to cleaner uh, fuels, cleaner technologies, cleaner industries. And suddenly we see an economic shift towards the kinds of things that we need to be um, using in our society. So that was a, a long answer to your question. Uh, but I actually want to mention one last thing. So that was all from a climate change, change standpoint. There is an immediate benefit that you do get at the community level by shifting to take, I think your example was cars, by shifting to electric cars. Um, and that immediate benefit is exactly what I study on a day-to-day -day basis, which is air pollution that harms human health. Um, by everybody switching in your cars uh, to less gas powered vehicles and more electrics and hybrids, you're um, affecting the local air quality in your community very noticeably. And that you will see and you will benefit from because it's it's those pollutants that are local pollutants that are harming people's health, that are causing asthma, that are causing cardiovascular diseases or, or contributing to them. So that's something that is a co-benefit that you get um, in trying to also address climate change. Great. Um... Another question here from Diana. She says, you mentioned finding solutions outside of innovation, which leads to two questions to me. How old does a forest need to be to consider a good carbon sink? And on the innovative side, what is considered a good trade-off between using energy to build new infrastructure to sink carbon and the time to see payoff? Um, okay, I might need you to rephrase the second question, but I'll, I'll start to and at the second point, I'll, I'll answer the first one first. So um, if you are starting from a, <clears throat> a, a baseline of no forest and it's just a little shrub in the grassland, um, then every foot of growth of the trees is going to be added carbon sequestration because all that carbon that's, that's uh, contributing to the mass of the tree, the actual wood of the tree and the roots of the tree, that's all carbon that's getting pulled out of the atmosphere. It's called carbon fixation. So that's, um, you're literally seeing trees built from the atmosphere. And I think that, uh, so, so yeah, uh, it doesn't have to be really any age to start to get carbon sequestration. You get it uh, immediately from the point at which the seed, you know, becomes a sprout and from every point of growth. Uh, now, once you get to a, a point where a tree, a forest is very old and maybe it's not, um, growing in size anymore, then you get to a stabilization of that carbon sequestration. But from lands that were transitioning from non-forest to forest, uh, if it's a de deserted or a deforested land, the gains are immediate in terms of carbon sequestration. And then, um, uh, Hillary, do you mind mentioning the second point? Yeah, so the second question was on the innovative side, what is considered a good trade-off between using energy to build new infrastructure to sink carbon and the time to see payoff? Yeah, so it's a great question and it, it, it's, uh, it needs to be a case-by-case -case calculation. So um, scientists and engineers, they know how much energy it takes to build a windmill, for instance, and they know how long roughly they're gonna last and how much energy they're gonna produce. So the calculation for a windmill is gonna be different than it is for a solar power uh, facility. And those are gonna both be different in and of themselves, depending on where they're located and how constant the wind is and how, how strong the sun is. Um, so the trade-off is important to consider, um, but it's, it's gonna change depending on what you're looking at. Uh, now, the, there was a documentary, I don't know if any of you saw it, it was called, um, it was called Planet of the Humans. Uh, and it was basically talking all about how uh, even the renewable energy sector is, is polluting. And the reason it's polluting and it is because in order to build a windmill and build a, a solar panel, it's, it's an industry that requires extraction of minerals. And that's the case for you know, just about anything. I mean, it's, it's an ex anything that's 
a product is coming usually from an extractive industry of some sort. The benefits of, so for in those ways, fossil fuels and windmills and solar panels are, are equal in terms of their, um, and I don't say that from a strictly numbers standpoint. I mean, conceptually they're equal in that they're both extractive industries to build the devices and the infrastructure that you need to produce energy. So now you've got these two um, extractive resource intensive industries. Uh, the fossil fuel industry that is going to continue to be extractive in that the fuel itself is coming from under the ground and it's going to have to be shipped to the plant and then when you burn it, it produces carbon emissions. Whereas the benefits then uh, of the green infrastructure are that it's no longer extractive once it's built. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind, but in terms of the actual math, it's really going to differ on a case-to-case -case basis. That makes sense. Um, we have a question from Jamie. Can you please give several concrete examples of human-caused climate change seen right here at Newport Bay? Okay, so, well, sea level is actually one of them. Um, it's not something that you notice, uh, you know, maybe every single year, but if you're somebody who's lived in Newport Bay for a very long time, you might notice that the king tides, those very high tides, are getting higher and higher and higher. And the frequency of storm surge from those, you know, big, uh, the big surf that comes in on the high tides um, is getting more uh, dramatic. I know there was recently in the Newport Peninsula um, a, a, a big episode of inundation by the ocean. And I can, somebody who's grown up in the area, firsthand attest to, um, I had never, I actually got lucky and lived uh, for seven months in a house that was bordering the harbor, right on the harbor. It had a dock. And the reason I could afford that was because my, um, it was a house that was going to get demoed. <laughs> I was searching for an apartment and I thought, hey, if I can live on the harbor even for seven months, give it to me. So that gave me some interesting insight about sea level in the harbor. And I would look at the sea level rise and it was at the King Tide event, six inches high, uh, not exaggerating, about six inches from breaching the, the harbor walls and infiltrating uh, these multi-million dollar homes. And, and I can't quote the, how close it was 20, 30 years ago, but I am very inclined to believe that the people who built that uh, did not build a seawall that would only give them a six inch buffer from these multi-million dollar houses. And the other anecdote I can share from that is that the house that we were renting um, the garden actually during these king tides would actually get infiltrated by seawater. I was frustrated for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of them being that I had actually planted crops and I was hoping to get some tomatoes and I had ocean water literally coming into the garden, uh, percolating through the top of the seawall and actually about 15 feet into the patio or the back patio of this home. So um, <clears throat> those types of homes are getting renovated uh, to be built now. 17 inches, I think it is higher because of sea level rise. So that's one uh, concrete example that is affecting the Newport Bay area. Um, and in terms of other, other um, examples, you know, we're all not very far from wildfires that have ensued. We're seeing, um, you know, heat waves hit that didn't typically previously hit at the frequency they hit. And this is all gonna place uh, stress on the ecosystem. Um, and the animals that inhabit the ecosystem. There are freshwater fish that are um, all over California, finding it more difficult to fare as stream waters are warming up. And also during some of these heat waves, we get more algal growth in some of these freshwater ecosystems, which are playing, placing burdens on um, some of these species. Butterflies, the monarch species, monarch butterfly, which many of you probably uh, love and maybe even you have milkweed in your yard. Um, those are it, just two, a year ago, I interviewed an expert at San Luis Obispo University uh, um, up in Central California about the, I think it was a 90% crash in the, the monarch butterfly species. Um, not exactly clear as to what it is, but climate change is, uh, is hypothesized to certainly be playing a role. And uh, as we force the migration of species we're actually, in some cases, forcing them 
beyond the boundaries that we had set aside that are considered wildlife sanctuaries and protected areas. Uh, because of temperatures, species are on the move and they're sadly moving in some cases beyond where they're actual or historically protected. Um, so, so again, a, a long answer, uh, so play with well. Thank you. Um, Lisa had a comment with a question. Um, she says, my dad likes to talk about climate change with me and always talks about how most of it is fake science. He likes to send me articles about a scientist who I believe is paid to say it's fake and also mentions the amount of scientists that don't support it. How do you deal with this in your field and why is this topic a conflict in science? Okay, uh, who, who was that question posed by? Uh, it was Lisa. Lisa. Um, well, Lisa, I, I really hope that you give your father a copy of my book for Christmas. <laughs> I, I don't see that facetiously. I've actually, um, one of my best friend's father uh, is similar to, I think, it was, I think it was your father that you were describing. I was similar to your father and he, he read my book with a highlighter and uh, planning to let me have it of all these, these sentences that just were a bunch of junk. And by the end of, halfway through the book, he put his highlighter down and uh, after he read the book, he gave me a pile of articles um, that were supporting climate denialism uh, that he wanted to basically turn into me and to throw away because he had he, he no longer believed that that was the case. So I, I really do encourage you. I don't say that because I'm trying to sell a book. I, I wrote the book for people like your father and um, even if not for him, for you to be able to talk with him. So I, I think that probably a lot of what you're going to hear from your dad is is literally addressed in a single chapter and then another chapter in the book. So I, I would just say that as a side note. Um, now, how do I deal with that? It's not, um, I think it's better actually to say how I don't deal with that. And the way I don't deal with that is by um, getting angry or frustrated. I think that it's important to understand that 99.9% .9 of the people who talk about climate change are not climate scientists. Um, so we're all really just relaying information that we've gotten somewhere. So I think acknowledging, acknowledging from the outset that, hey, look, I'm, I'm not an expert uh, and, and you're not an expert. So let's just talk about where the different sources of information that we're hearing and whether or not they might be true. Um, here's what I've come to learn through, you know, maybe it's a scientist who spoke to me at the National or the uh, Newport Bay Conservancy or an article from a NASA scientist. Um, but at the end of the day, we're arguing over sources, and it's important to, to not get so personally attached to your pers uh, what you're saying or your perspective, and maybe, you know, let the sources be the, the, the source of the, of the spotlight and, and the frustration. Um, and try to find common ground with the people who disagree with you. And I think one area to do it, and your father may have said this to you, that climate change is natural. Um, I, didn't, uh, I think acknowledging that, hey, yeah, you're right, climate change is natural. <clears throat> um, it's been changing for millions of years, and it'll continue to change for millions of years, uh, can actually put you on to an understanding ground with that person. And then going on to say that, however, there is a increased rate of climate change that we're seeing right now, which is really concerning. And it's pretty uh, pretty persuasive that, that it's related to human activity for a variety of reasons. And I think it's something we should really take seriously and be concerned about. Um, but not coming along saying, you know, you're right, I'm wrong, uh, you know, my sources are, are better than your sources. It's really just trying to have a conversation and understand. I think we tend to not ask enough questions. Um, I have climate skeptic friends that I can talk with for a long time and um, Try to understand why it is somebody feels a certain way, and uh, you know sometimes we want to talk more than we want to listen, and, and we all have that tendency. And I think it's important to sometimes try to figure out where they're coming from. Uh, I'll just quickly tell a 30-second anecdote. Uh, I was in Texas and pulled up to a gas station. I had a, a logo on the side of our car that said "On the Road for Climate Action," and I, I had this guy at the gas pump walk up to me and said, uh, "You know what's all this? What's this climate business?" And I explained to him, oh, I'm on the road talking about climate change, giving talks. Um, and he said exactly what I just told you. He said, uh, well, climate change is, the climate's been changing forever. And I did exactly what I told you. I said, you're right, it has been changing forever and it'll continue to change. 
I told them about the rate of change and it's something that's uh, concerning and that's you know what I'm on the road alerting people about and trying to empower people to, to, to understand and, and take charge of in their own lives and anyways we got to talking and at the end of the conversation he actually bought a book out of the trunk of my car which was I thought really exciting to see that that whole dynamic evolve and um, I think that we can actually make opportunities out of what would otherwise be kind of conflicting situations if we kind of uh, just put our guards down and, and hear people out and try to talk. All right, looks like we have five more minutes. Of, uh, I think that's such great advice. It's so important to like acknowledge where someone else is coming from. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, even the most, maybe not the most vehement uh, climate denialism, but uh, I think a lot of the people who refuse the notion of climate change, human climate change, it's not that they don't care about the climate, it's not that they don't care about the environment or the planet or the species, at least most of them, I'm sure there are some exceptions, uh, it's that they don't believe that it's being threatened, that they don't believe the climate is changing, they don't believe that the, the earth is, you know, under, um, you know, threat. So, you know, we're not mostly talking about people who are evil and bad people. They're just people who don't believe that something's happening that we, you know, believe is happening based on the science. So uh, that's kind of how I, I also talk about that too in, in my book. I think it's important to keep that. Um, one more question came through in the chat and that was, was the recent climate countdown clock released in Times Square the other day too pessimistic? Seven years to disaster. I always uh, never like to see those those quantitative things applied where there really isn't uh, quantitative reason. Um, so yeah, it's it's too pessimistic, but it's and what's going to happen is in seven years when the Earth is the same as it was um, in eight years or similar, you're going to have the naysayers say, "Oh, that was a bunch of junk. Why do you have a seven-year clock?" Um, because <clears throat> there's no there's no threshold at seven years that is going to be um, observably different the next day than it was, you know, a year prior or whatever. So, um, but the point there is important, and I think that it's important to really try to mobilize action and drive home the point that the climate is um, teetering really on a balance. That seven-year clock comes from uh, what was the IPCC, which said that we have about 10 years to um, avoid irreversible warming. However, that number was within a certain probability. And of course, that probability is not taken into account when we just say uh, seven years. Hey, it could be four years, maybe. It could be 15 years. So there's error bars around these numbers. So when they get utilized so strictly and concretely in the media, um, it, it's always frustrating to a scientist. But, you know, that's kind of how the world works. Well, if anyone has any last questions for Shahir, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. We have just a couple more minutes. Everyone's overwhelmed. <laughs> um, I wanted one more follow up. If, if somebody wants to, while you're thinking of questions, um, I said it's too pessimistic. I kind of want to rephrase that. Um, it's too. It's too binary. It's too um, binary, uh, you know, black, white. It's not too pessimistic. The climate change situation is extremely uh, important and, and quite frankly frightening. I mean, it's a, it's if you look at the graphs, if you really dive into the, what's happening and then you take into effect the positive feedback systems that actually might force the climate to move into a, a state that's beyond our own control. Um, I do not think the seven year clock is too pessimistic. I just think it's too binary, it's too concrete, and it, it, it basically leaves um, ourselves vulnerable to an inevitable, it, it inevitably getting thrown back in the faces of the people who put it. Um, Well, if no one has any more questions, we will thank Shahir for his time and all of his knowledge. Um, do check out his website and his book. 
Uh, on Saturday, we will be following up uh, right from Shahir's kind of last point on things you can do yourself with the recycling, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. We are we have a climate, um, sorry, not climate, um, <laughs> uh, trash talk, um, coastal cleanup day webinar. And so we have five different speakers lined up who are gonna be talking all about uh, plastic pollution, trash, and that impact on the environment. So a different uh, thing that humans are doing to our environment. Um, if you haven't registered for that, make sure you do register for that. Um, and I'm going to put the website into the chat right now. Um, and that is all for tonight. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Take care. Feel free to stay in touch.